Hi, I'm Megan and welcome to my kitchen. In today's video, I'll be sharing four recipes with you for Thanksgiving side dishes. These are all easy to make and super delicious, so let's get into the recipes. First up, I'm making my granny's dressing. She used to make this every Thanksgiving and we kind of carry on the tradition and make it. Let me show you the ingredients that I use. First, I use chicken thighs. You could, of course, use chicken breasts, chicken drumsticks. Uh, you could use a cut-up chicken, whatever chicken you find at a good price. I also always have some chicken broth on hand. Sometimes I need it, sometimes I don't. You'll need some cooked cornbread. What I like to do is, because it's just my husband and I, when I make a full batch of cornbread, most of the time we can only eat maybe half. So I will put the other half in the freezer. And, you know, for the couple months before Thanksgiving, I'll do that a couple times so I have some extra cornbread. Um, and then I just take it out and thaw it, and it works perfectly in this. But you can also just cook up some cornbread. You could use a box mix or your favorite recipe. It doesn't really matter. You'll need some salt, pepper, hard-boiled eggs, some ground sage, and an onion. I'm going to start by cooking the chicken. So I've placed my thighs into this pot, covered it with water. I like to add in a teaspoon or two of some kind of chicken bouillon. I don't think Granny did that, but I like to do it. You don't have to do it, it's not necessary. I just think it bumps up the chicken flavor a little bit. I'm going to bring that to a boil. Once it's at a boil, I'm reducing it to a simmer. And then you'll just cook this until the chicken is 165 degrees internal temperature. Once it's there, I'm going to remove it to this bowl and allow it to cool. Don't don't get rid of that broth though. You definitely want to keep that broth. We're going to use that as the chicken stock. In this mixing bowl, I'm going to add in the cornbread and then crumble it really well with my hands. While I'm doing that, just a quick note, if you've never heard of dressing before, dressing is pretty much the same thing as stuffing. Um, basically, from what I've been told, the difference is dressing is cooked outside of the you know bird the chicken turkey whatever it is that you're cooking while stuffing is placed inside of the bird while you're cooking it um, there are a lot of differences in stuffing and dressing they mostly depend on you know where you're from what your family traditions are here in the south it's pretty common to have cornbread dressing that's how my family has always made it but you make it how you and your family like it totally feel free if you try this recipe to change it up use whatever you and your family like instead of chicken if you want to use cooked sausage do that if you want to use cube bread do that so to the cornbread here I have some onion that I've diced my hard-boiled eggs that I peeled and diced I have the chicken I just tear it apart with my hands and then I'm going to add the chicken to the cornbread and the uh, onion and hard-boiled eggs then I'm seasoning this with some salt and pepper and then the ground sage. Now, my granny put a lot of sage in her dressing. I do the same thing. Again, that's how we like it. You can go easier on the sage, but I probably put in maybe a tablespoon. Then I'm going to add that broth that is left over from cooking the chicken, and I'm going to stir that together. Now, with this, it's kind of hard to explain it, but you basically want to add enough broth to where there's no dry cornbread, but you don't want to add so much that it's really soupy. You just want to really make sure you have a nice moist mixture. Once that's done, I'm going to place that into a greased casserole dish. Now I'm having Granny's recipe because I was just making this for my husband and I, but the full recipe makes a nine by 13, which I'll have it uh, typed out in the description box below. I'm going to place this into a preheated oven set at 350 degrees and bake this for about 45 minutes or until it's golden brown. Here's the finished dressing. This is so yummy. Now, a, qu a quick note, I forgot to mention this. Before you put this into the oven, give it a little taste. You don't have any raw eggs or anything like that in there, so you don't have to worry about it. But give it a little taste and adjust the seasonings. You can add you know, more sage, a little more salt, a little more pepper, whatever you feel like it needs. But that's it, super easy, and this is delicious. Served alongside some turkey and my dad's giblet gravy. Oh, so, so good. Next up, I'm making pineapple casserole. Now, if you've never heard of this before, if you've never had it, you might look at the ingredients and think, what in the world is this? And I agree with you, the ingredients sound a little wacky. And if I knew what the ingredients were before I had it, I probably never would have tried it, but I'm glad that I did. I had it a few years ago at a work potluck and asked what was in it and the lady gave me the recipe. I don't remember the exact recipe that she gave to me. I didn't write it down that day, but I found one online that I feel like is pretty similar and I've made it since then and it's yummy. It goes 
perfectly with ham. It, it just, the ham and the pineapple casserole together goes perfectly together. So if you make a ham for, you know, any of your upcoming holidays, I highly recommend you give this a recipe a try. Like I said, I know that it sounds weird, but trust me, it's yummy. Let me show you the ingredients that you'll need. You'll need sugar, all-purpose flour, some pineapple chunks, or you could also use tidbits. Don't drain off all of the juice though. You need to reserve a little bit of the juice, some Ritz crackers, butter, and some shredded cheddar cheese. I have my oven preheated to 350 degrees. In this bowl, I'm going to add in my reserved pineapple juice. I'll have the recipe listed in the description box below for this. If you are making this for a family dinner, I would suggest doubling the recipe though. To that juice, I'm going to add in the flour and then I am going to combine that until it's smooth. Next, I'm going to add in the sugar, the drained pineapple, and the shredded cheddar cheese, and I'm going to stir that until it's combined well. I'm going to set that to the side, and then I'm going to spray my dish with some cooking spray. Now, the recipe suggests to use a one-quart uh, casserole dish for this, but it also said that a pie pan works great for it, and I agree. The, the pie plate was the perfect amount for this, but like I said, if you're making this for a family dinner, I would double it. I'm going to add in that pineapple mixture and spread that out. Then I'm going to set that to the side. And in the same bowl that I mix everything up in, I just washed it out um, really well and dried it. I'm going to add in the butter. I'm going to place that into the microwave until it's melted. Then I'm going to take my Ritz crackers, crush those up, stir the crackers in with the butter, and then place that on top of the casserole. This is going to go into the preheated oven and bake for about 20 to 25 minutes or until those Ritz crackers are golden brown. Here's the finished casserole. I do like to let it sit just for a couple minutes before I serve it up. And like I said, this is super yummy. Just goes so great with ham. If you've never tried this before, I recommend you give it a try. Next up, I tried a new recipe for roasted Brussels sprouts and butternut squash. This was delicious. I would make this again, and I recommend you all give this a try. You'll need thyme, olive oil, maple syrup, salt and pepper, Brussels sprouts, and butternut squash. Just to make it easy on myself, I bought the Brussels sprouts that were already halved, and I bought the butternut squash that's already, you know, peeled and cubed, and then a red onion. The oven is preheating to 400 degrees, and I veered off the recipe just a little bit, which I'll have the recipe linked in the description box below. The recipe said to put the sheet pan into the oven while it was preheating. I forgot to do that. I just covered the cookie sheet with some aluminum foil, sprayed it with a little bit of cooking spray. I'm going to add my Brussels sprouts and my butternut squash. Then I'm chopping up the onion and adding that. I'm going to drizzle a little bit of olive oil over top. Then I'm adding a little salt and pepper just to taste. Then the dried thyme. And finally, the maple syrup. And that's part of the reason why I laid down the aluminum foil. I wasn't sure if the maple syrup would get sticky and caramelized. So for easier cleanup, I laid the foil down. I'm going to drizzle the maple syrup over and then toss the vegetables and seasonings together. And then that's it. This is going to go into the preheated oven. I roasted it for about 15 to 18 minutes. Took it out, tossed the vegetables, and placed them back for another 15 or 18 minutes just until the squash is tender and the Brussels sprouts are roasted. Here's the finished dish. This was delicious, like I said, and it was really easy. And especially if you get the already halved Brussels sprouts and the already cubed butternut squash, this is a super quick and easy side dish to put together for Thanksgiving or any of the upcoming holidays or just a regular weeknight meal. Finally, I'm making potato rolls. I got this recipe over 15 years ago and I've made it since then. And I like these rolls. I think they're really yummy. I like the little bit of sweetness that they have. And I feel like this is a pretty easy recipe. I've mentioned before on my channel, but I am not a big baker, specifically yeasted things like bread or pizza dough and rolls. But again, I find this recipe easy. Let me show you how I make it. We'll start out with the ingredients that you'll need. You'll need salt all-purpose flour, sugar, shortening, yeast, eggs, milk. And I apologize, I have this non-fat dry milk here. It was for another recipe, ignore it. You do not need this non-fat dry milk. I apologize for it being there. And then you also need plain mashed potatoes. You can cook up a couple potatoes and have those. 
I just use instant potatoes. I just follow the instructions on the back of the box and just don't add any, you know, flavoring, salt, pepper, butter, anything like that. So those are the ingredients that you'll need. To get started, I'm using a hand mixer. I just recently got this. Before now, I always did it by hand. So if you don't have a stand mixer, you can absolutely make this as well. You, you don't need that. In this bowl, I've added in the shortening. I'm going to add in the sugar. And with the paddle attachment, I'm just going to beat that until it is combined. And I wanted to show you what this looks like at this stage because it looks kind of chunky and separated and you might think you've screwed something up. You haven't. This is the way that it's supposed to look like, but don't worry about it. It all turns out in the end. To that, I'm going to add my milk. Now this milk has been scalded and cooled. All that means is you place the milk on a pot on the stove, bring it up slowly until it's almost at a boil and then turn it off and just allow it to cool. Then I'm going to add in my eggs, then the salt, Next, I'm adding in the mashed potatoes. And like I said, you can use, you know, homemade mashed potatoes if you'd like. But again, to make it easier on myself, I just use the instant potatoes and they always work out just fine. I'm going to turn the mixer back on once I've added those potatoes. And then I'm going to add in my yeast. Now, in this measuring cup here, I have some warm water. I'm adding my yeast and I'm just going to give that a little stir to dissolve it and then add that to the mixer. I'm going to let that go for a minute or two to get everything stirred together and then I'm just scraping down the bowl and I'm going to switch attachments. I'm going to remove that paddle and add the dough hook. Now I'm going to add in the flour and I like to do this cup by cup. I always start out with a cup and then I'll add more. The recipe, the original recipe for this called for four to six cups of uh, flour. It normally takes me about five, five and a half. So just, you know, like I said, add the flour slowly. And when it starts to form a ball, then you have enough flour, it's done. Now, once you've got enough flour, I just turn the mixer on and allow it to knead for about three to five minutes. And like I said, if you don't have a mixer, no worries. Just put a little flour out on your counter and knead it with your hands. It's kind of a pain to do it for, you know, three to five minutes by hand but it, it can be done. Once you have your kneaded dough ball, I remove it from the bowl, spray it with a little cooking spray, and then put the ball back in. I'm going to cover this with a towel, and you want to put this in a warm place and allow it to rise for 60 to 90 minutes. After that 60 to 90 minutes, you're going to remove the towel, punch down the dough, and then I like to sprinkle a little bit of flour on my hands and then a little bit on the counter. I like to make about two ounce dough balls. Um, sometimes I've done up to two and a half ounce, but I feel like those are just a good size for dinner. I always measure the first one on my kitchen scale. You don't have to do that, it's not necessary. But once I feel like I have the first one, then I can kind of you know do the rest. But just with my flour on the counter and with my hands, I just roll the balls of dough in my hands until they form little dough balls. And then I place them onto a greased cookie sheet. I'm going to cover them with the clean kitchen towels and allow them to rise for another 30 minutes. Here are the rolls after they've risen. You'll bake these in a preheated oven set to 300 and I'm sorry set to 400 degrees and you'll bake these for I mean it really just depends on how big you make the rolls these size rolls took about 15 minutes in the oven once they're slightly golden brown they're done you'll remove them from the oven and then I like to brush a little melted butter on top and that's it they're ready to serve now something that I also love to do is to make like the copycat uh, Texas Roadhouse honey butter it's so good I'll link the recipe that I normally use with that in the description box below. Like I said, it's super easy and yummy, but these are just fine with just a little bit of plain butter. All right, that's it. Thank you so much for watching. I hope that you liked this video and I hope you have a great rest of the day. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.